So they decide to forego the uh, the two sets of double doors or do any extensive searching in here, and uh, may just make it for the back mural. And I'd written, I'd actually written um, flavor text, I guess you could say, uh, narration for each area of the keep as they entered it. And it's something I picked up on uh, on an old uh, second edition box set. I'm not sure if every module or anything written by TSR or Wizards of the Coast has had this, but uh, something to read to the players as they enter any given room, kind of giving them as a, a more thorough, well-thought-out description of each location. And uh, I, I really liked the way it ended up working out with that. Um, I'll probably end up doing that in the future unless I find it to end up boring or slowing down the group. But uh, as they approached, I had uh, prepared a paragraph of text describing the mural they'd found was actually a four figures, uh, four knights of the sworn, that had been the masters of this keep and uh, the head trainers of the old army of Arya back in the de uh, the dragon days or the before the Battle of Greymoor. Uh, except the four heroes all have their heads missing in the painting, like the the canvas is actually been cut and their heads are torn out. Not, like, torn, but neatly removed. And uh, they find a piece of canvas, actually, at, the, the, at their feet, in front of the mural. They flip it over to see the face of an elf. Well, they look up at the painting, and well, there's an elven body with no face. Ipso facto, they hold it up to the wall. Magically, it heals itself with great pomp and elegance. And both sets of double doors click open. I'd actually had them set locked. Well, we had a couple stealthy characters, a couple high dexterity characters in the group. Of course, they could have found a way to pick the locks or uh, maybe bash them down even. I, I had some high DC checks set up for that because I wanted them to go through it a certain way. I'm not sure I was really trying to force them down a given, any given path more than... I wanted it to be possible, but not necessarily simple, to stray from the path I had in my head. So, uh, so yeah, again, they, they, they put that piece, the piece of the painting back together, the two sets, both sets of doors unlock, and then they do something I hadn't even thought about. Uh, they decide to split the party, and great, let's do it. So they, uh, Coltar, our assassin, decides to go first, into the northern set of doors, and as soon as he opens it, he uh, face, he's an Eladrin, he face steps into the center of the room. I didn't even think of that. I had this room set up as a trap encounter, a, a kind of a cool magical fire trap, where uh, as soon as they entered the room, fire would shoot from the fireplace and start bouncing randomly around the room. And uh, they'd have to make a, uh, some high dexterity character in my head was going to make a, a, a series of uh, progressively increasing uh, acrobatics checks to uh, successfully make their way to the back of the room where they would then have to, on their own, figure out that there was a set, two sets of candles, one lit, one not, to light the second one would stop the trap. Well, they don't, do, they don't go for that at all. So uh, Coltar is sitting here just performing massive acrobatics and uh, dodging this, dodging that, taking a little damage here, taking a little damage there, but still dodging, doing cool. It had to be, you know, in my, in my mind's eye, this is the part of the movie where Neo is just being awesome. And uh, uh, Valeth actually decides, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fire an arrow, a lit arrow, at this candle. And he decides, instead of saying, well, I'm going to light my own arrow, and I'm going to fire it and shoot, he says, Andrus will light the arrow, and I'll shoot it. I said, well, that's kind of an odd way to do it, but whatever. Okay, so he fires his arrow, and he rolls a nat 20. I mean, he splits the wick on this candle. Unfortunately, uh, Anders botched lighting. I mean, he rolled really low. I'm, uh, I'm having fun at this point. We've got an 11-year-old at the table. I'm not taking everything too seriously. So he holds his tor a torch up to light it, and the arrow goes right through the flame. It doesn't combust. But uh, this is... Uh, I think it was more of a, uh, instead of any sort of footing in realism or rules or doctrine or fourth edition this, anything, I think I was just uh, more picking on that player because he'd been just rolling horribly the last couple of sessions of anything we've played together. 
And for him to finally get a 20 on just a simple, I'm going to shoot at that candle. Not an enemy, not anything else. It was just so unfortunate for him. But eventually they do decide to uh, fire another flaming arrow. This one has ignited, except uh, they botched the roll so badly that it almost hits uh, Coltar, our assassin, who's wildly, magically flipping throughout the room to avoid this ball of fire that's shot out of the fireplace at him. And uh, he decides to take that arrow and light the candle, extinguishing the trap and making the room safe. As the fire extinguishes, it shoots back into the fireplace, fizzles out, and the back wall of the fireplace opens, revealing a dark passageway. Okay, so at this point, uh, I believe it was Valeth and Coltar, one of our rangers, and our assassin decide to go check out the other room. Meanwhile, Zyria, Dreda, Andrus, and uh, Shepard have decided to stay in this meeting hall, or, or you know, large, large room they've been in with the fire trap, and uh, do some more investigation. <coughs> so I cut to them, the two offshoots, going off to investigate the other room and uh, let the others sit on their laurels for a moment while they investigate. And uh, so they go to the door, the other door, and open it and make their way inside. And I'd, I'd again written flavor text for the room, that it was a bunk room, eight, eight beds adorn the walls, uh, and in the center, they notice the floor is just covered in spider webs. And I, I emphasized that point, that the, the, the room was actually filled with spider's webs, but no one really seemed to take any heed to that. Uh, I mean, maybe they cataloged it just and just thought, we'll, we'll, we'll kill anything in here. So, uh, a death jump spider creeps out from under one of the beds and initiates combat. And, uh, so they start fighting with this thing and, uh, they don't shout for help. They don't, they don't call the other members of the party. They just start fighting this thing. And I believe Coltar Faze stepped behind it and, uh, started doing some damage while Valeth started swinging his twin blades at it. And, uh... I think two rounds in, I had it set that a second death jump spider would crawl out of some rubble in the corner and attack the party as well. Well, we've got two level two characters in here now and two level four skirmishers in the room. I'm getting a little nervous for these two. These, guys, these monsters have poison. They have a uh, randomly regenerating leap attack. Uh, this could be dangerous. This is... Uh, Here's where I started to notice that one of my faults in 4th edition is I'm forcing manual perception checks on things that they're not looking for. Like, they're not necessarily... The other rest of the party isn't really like saying, well, I want to listen to hear what's going on in the other room. No, they're in doing their own thing. I shouldn't have been forcing perception checks. I should have, have written down their character's passive perception and worked off that. Making my own checks, maybe. And uh, so I think that would have been more smooth. I'll probably do that in the future. <laughs>